Excellent. Uh, so thank you so much to Ole, Olaf, and Hercules for the great presentation. I think we can carry on with the Q&A and the discussion around AI and uh, geothermal. So I would like to pose the first question and I would like to hear your opinion. Um, the first question is that how can data science and AI leverage the vast data from oil and gas industry to accelerate geothermal development in more cost efficient way? What specific techniques or approach do you foresee as a game changer in optimizing the full value chain from exploration all the way to energy extraction in geothermal sector? I do that yeah, let's first, start with first all <laughs> Yes. So um, in, in our experience, uh, the, the challenges related to geothermal is uh, high temperatures, hot rocks, and, and open fractures. Huh? Uh, we we see that um, the the um, oil and gas wells drilled mostly in sedimentary rocks have uh, different characteristics. Uh, yet we we see that uh, uh, there are certain areas of the world, certain um, type of wells, certain type of formation that can be used as a first pass for training and validating models and concepts. Um, we are doing that now by using using the kind of brittle fault faults that we see experience in the um, in the the active seismic areas in the Himalayas and the Andes that somehow resembles the the uh, fracture systems around uh, uh, geothermal vents. Uh, we try to use um, consolidated and cemented sandstones as a proxy for the the uh, basalts that we would encounter in in many of the, the geothermal areas um but still um we cannot be certain we do need data from actual geothermal wells to validate and test what we've we've done but what uh, what we definitely can do with the data that is cherry picked from the oil and gas wells throughout the world is is to validate and discard a lot of concepts we we and and just finding things that doesn't work uh, also give uh, a tremendous value for us thank you olaf ole well as a <laughs> as a systems engineer i, I don't know if i'm <laughs> that qualified to, to go into that level of detail but on a general note um i can say that uh, I talked a bit about how we 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 sort of train uh, 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 models to to embed textual information uh, and also semantically retrieve information from it. So some of these concepts are probably uh, transferable to uh, uh, to uh, knowledge bases from the oil and gas industry. So you can you can train these models to. Uh, to uh, to uh, identify positives in a geothermal sense rather than in an oil and gas sense, and and have them semantically extract information that is uh, interesting. So, yeah. Thanks, Ole. Hercules, what's your thought? Yeah, I'd say I, I'd say that tra this transfer is is very important. I think uh, expertise obviously is is very important. I'd say you know I've never worked in oil and gas, but my understanding is that data collection is is, is is superior is is just uh, treated more seriously in in oil and gas than, than it has been in, in geothermal in geothermal what we have is um very good data collection when it comes to people at the power plant using information for operational needs uh but you know as a data science data scientist myself trying to 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 uh make big things in, in geothermal uh, the first step is always, okay, let's get your data sorted so we can access it properly. So I think that's one thing we can learn how to harmonize this need for digital infrastructure, which isn't really present in geothermal in, in the way that it needs to be for us to capitalize on these immense opportunities. So I've seen this in many other sectors, in you know software and enterprise software and, and these kind of areas where as soon as you make data available to experts, they'll tell you what the important things are. So it's it sounds a little kumbaya, but really democratizing at the risk of sounding like a Silicon Valley person, uh, democratizing access to data is the most important thing. 
the thing is that I can come in as an expert, so-called, and tell people what to do. But really, the people in the power plant already know everything they, they, they need to know to make the best decisions. So making data available to everybody is really important. And I think that's one thing we can learn from, from other sectors. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree with all the your assessments, but let's move on to this sec sector that, okay, when it comes to leveraging AI, training these models, how much uh, of data is enough data? This is the first question. And then the second question, how we can train model on geothermal when there is no common data source to use for training? I can talk about uh, how much data uh, first. So how much clean data is the question we need to be asking. Um, we, you can throw a lot of rubbish information to, to an algorithm and it's never gonna get better. So again, data curation is extremely important. When we went through Gumo as a fully fledged research project, a huge part of it was a data simulation uh, piece. And this is, you know, in data science, the adage is 90% of data science is data cleaning. Definitely true, always true, always also true in geothermal. So, you know, we've come up with a, a geothermal data standard for that reason, so that people can start to kind of consolidate around that. I think that's really important. Before I was working on, on Google, I was working as a data scientist in geothermal and just kind of noticing that there's no standards around. Uh, I think that if I extract something from that question is, is the need for a data standard and kind of under, all kind of joining together in having access uh, to data the same way, because inevitably we are in a very bespoke situation. This is why Google is a digital twin creator it's, and it's not a, a generic generalized algorithm. Every steam field is unique. The components might be the same, but the, the outcome is completely unique. So we're never gonna have tra complete transfer learning from one geothermal field to another, just as easily as they do in other sectors of, of artificial intelligence. So thank you. Uh, I think there is one specific question for Olaf. So mm -hmm. uh, it, the, the audience really like your presentation. And the question here is, did uh, data from how many wells has been ingested to build the models? And how many rigs has this approach been utilized on? And what is the reaction time from uh, the model to avoid losses or stock pipe? Okay, uh, that, that was three questions in one. I'll, I'll try to, to address it. The the number of wells needed is is um, uh, or available uh, is directly relatable to the quality of the output. Huh? So the first version we launched, we we had five training wells. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to, uh, from a drilling engineering perspective, huh, to understand what are the anomalies, what are the, the good things, what, what is actually happening with the data. Uh, currently, we have um, a curated data set of about 450 wells that we use to train the data, uh, the, the models from. Um, we, we've been very careful in the type of data that we use. So uh, addressing Hercules' uh, this concerns is we, we've only used data that we think, of, of course, can, can do something with, with the problem that we're trying to solve, huh? uh, but also data that is uh, transferable, that tells the same thing in... in um, in one well, in one field, in one region, uh, to another region. So we were in, in oil and gas. The, the the whole size and bit types are, are you know is something that changes with, with that. So we soon realized that if we use bit type and whole size and inputs, we need a training data set for each whole size and each bit, bit type, which would multiply the number of wells we needed to actually build something meaningful with, with a factor of 20, 50, whatever. So we decided, okay, let's see what we can do without these data. So so this has been, been um, there are some good people working working with us that has been, been able to, to provide sense out of that. 
And it was also the the number of rigs that we've used it on. It's uh, I I don't know. It's um, more than hundred at least. Uh, different rigs, different regions, different well types. Um, the the different lithologies. Lithology is also something that we've we've uh, uh, discounted from the equation because it's really hard to know. Huh? Even in uh, oil and gas drilling, where you have um, uh, gamma ray resistivity, all these different logs, it, it will still be be uh, difficult to adapt training to to the specific lithology, and you you will never know for certain what's down there. So that's also discounted. So so we try to generalize as good as we can. But obviously, uh, when uh, we see rocks, when we see wells that is outside the, the comfort zone of the models, when it hasn't been exposed to a basalt before, we need a basalt training set to, to deal with it. Um, and the, the reaction times, um, what we do, we, we consume data typically between every second or every 10 second. Um, we process uh, the data really quickly. We've standardized sort of providing output um, every every 30 seconds because that would be, be sufficient. I believe for for uh, losses and fractures, we need to, to do that quicker. Uh, we see that we, and that's not, that's not the problem. I mean, the processing, Time is, is really fast. It's sub second, but it's the 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 um, um, you know the infrastructure, the network, the the uh, uh, satellite links, and those kind of things that that limits the data traffic. Um, so so we, we need to see. Yeah? We we need to test and run pilots, and that is one of the things that we've we've set out as a prerequisite to to go out and launch. A not new product in a, in a new model that the, the the company that we go with and we work with uh, not only can provide uh, data for five, five to ten wells but also will allow us to to run um, one two or three pilots that we can use these live wells to adjust as we go and see how how the, the models actually perform in, in real life. It doesn't need that you need to act on it, but at least we can, um, our data scientists can sit and learn from, from the data that we receive and the output the models provide. That was a long answer. I hope they answered all three of the questions. So if I want to summarize what we learned so far is that we need data and we need to train data. We need to have a data-driven models and physics-based models, and then we need to validate that which means yes. that I need to go and, okay, perfect. So I my next, next question is around how uh, Ole actually referred to you. What lesson did you learn from trying to get the data out of operators as open access data is critical to be able to train AI? Well, I think that in Norway, we're kind of in a special situation because we have a very good national data repository for much of this data. So so, um, so uh, the data that we worked on so far um, is, is, is basically uh, uh, public. Saying that, it's very representative for the same data types that the, at, uh, that the operators have, have, have access to. So uh, we might be uh, in a little bit of a of a special situation in in um, in um, in Norway. But saying that, getting access to the data is, is of course very important. Uh, uh, but also sort of ensuring that you apply AI in sort of a, a, a cross functional uh, uh, matter. You need to 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 not only involve data scientists but also system engineers to build usable applications, and of course also subject matter experts to actually validate and and ensure that the stuff you build actually generates real value. So yeah, great. I think uh, I would like to switch a little bit on the uh, leveraging AI for environmental issues around geothermal, as you know. For enhanced geothermal system, we are uh, basically 
circulating a large volume of the water, right, into the fracture and sub, uh, subsurface system. So how AI, from your point of view, can mitigate uh, or actually reduce the risk of induced seismicity uh, during this type of system deployment? That, that's a tricky question for an old driller. Um, but um, what we built is, is built on, on time-based data and systems to detect anomalies in, in um, time-based data. So provided we have access to expertise that would help us to um, determine or, or tell us the, the patterns in the anomalies in the time-based data, we, we will be able to use AI to analyze and predict the data better than, than a human uh, can do. Uh, but, but we are, I believe, will be dependent on an ability to uh, find anomalies in the data. We, we, if we have large data sets, computers and AI can help us to find those anomalies. Uh, but but that would require larger data sets than typically would be available in, in our experience. I don't know I can what add to that. <laughs> Yeah, I can add to that a little bit. I, um, I don't have a specific example about seismicity, but I can talk about, in broad strokes, because it's, it's, it's a commercially sensitive project, but uh, a project that I did, and then it's generator where we had... Um, we had machinery tripping its its safety uh, threshold, right? So in that case, this was kind of a, a long project where the engineering approach, the engineering troubleshooting approach didn't bear any fruit. You know, they did everything they could. The local engineers who know the machine inside and out did everything they, they could. They got the equipment manufacturer. They got experts from, from overseas even uh, to look at it. And the engineering approach was kind of exhausted after a while. And uh, my boss at the time uh, went over and heard about this project and said, oh, for sure, her can solve this with data. And uh, okay, so when that dropped in, I said, hey, did you say for sure we can solve this with data? Because, okay, okay, fine. Then, then now we have to. So the, the long story short is that we did. We got close enough to, to a root cause to predict how the machine is going to be uh, performing, right? The assembly is going to be performing. So sometimes, uh, just to add um, to what you were saying, Olaf, it's yes, a lot of data, we did troll through a lot of data. This was like the, the raw historian data, every second of, of every gyro, every bit of machinery in that assembly. We're talking about a real assembly of thousands of, of engineering elements. Hundreds mm -hmm. of them have telemetry. So we had to be, do a really big research project. Uh, I think it took about three months to hmm. get to the, to the root cause uh, end, end to end. So, but the great thing about it and the positive thing about it is that we didn't need the a supervised learning approach, meaning that we didn't need the signals, the precursors of the signals to be identified. We just needed hmm. to say, okay, what happens uh, that, what, what kind of hidden things in the entropy in this chaotic hmm. system can you see that we can't see as humans, there will be heralds mm. of uh, the, the the alert system tripping. So, you know, this is not the easiest thing to do in that just, as I said, it was a lot of research. It was a lot of my time for about three months and it was a fair bit of engineering time because obviously I'm not an engineer. I don't know what the data mean and, and, until an engineer explains it to me, right? So I had a lot of experts uh, troubleshooting this. In this case, you know, this was, is worth a lot of revenue, so it was worth it. Uh, and of course, I would say induced seismicity is worth even more than revenue because we can't betray the trust of the people who are lending us the land to, to operate on, right? Uh, so I think it's worth every second that we, we, we spend to, to prevent really bad things from happening. That will have a, a really bad reputation uh, effect on our industry. 
Excellent. So I think let's move on on the efficiency and the cost reduction piece. So from this panel, what do you think where we can maximize the cost reduction by deploying AI um, in the geothermal full cycle value chain development? So what is your thought based on what you have seen and your experience? Well, I can say from from uh, from uh, my perspective, I think that uh, especially when looking at large corpuses of, of for instance, reports, um, uh, the type of AI pipelines I, I discussed can absolutely provide value with pinpointing specific fragments of information so, or, or science you're looking for. So that could be one easy example. I mean, yes, for me, obviously, I can I can talk about it's it's really the topic of my presentation, right? It's about making the best out of existing facilities. So, in terms of of revenue and in terms of cost and in terms of of making things more profitable, obviously, making the best of the facilities we have is is ideal, right? If we can get more out of what we already have, that's ideal, and that's what Guma is about. That's what optimization is about. Um, that's what you know unlocking parameter space that we've never looked at before uh, is about. And every complex bit of machinery has unseen parts of parameter space. We don't have time to do the math in our heads or on spreadsheets. So it, it's, with, with, go ahead, Olaf. Yeah, with, with our experience and background from, from drilling, it's it's definitely reducing the cost of each well. That's uh, that's where, where we can contribute. Yeah, so then, then it goes back to the uh, discussion we had in terms of who is leading here. Is it the oil and gas companies or entities? Is it the startups? Is that what? How do you seek partnership and collaboration to move faster? And what what is your request here? Because most of you are working on a startup setup, but I think you are coming from the oil and gas. So, what is your thought on that? I can say that for us, it's um, the expertise that we get in-house is, is hard to replicate in a simulation environment. So we're always, our, our preference always is to partner with generators because that's the people we want to serve. Um, that was the research project. The commercial project is the same. We, we want to be working with operators because there is, there's two kinds of data missing. There's arcane information that is kind of known in an organization, but never written down anyway. Uh, that's inevitable. Uh, it's not that people are, aren't doing their jobs right, it's that they have no time to write everything down and record it in a way that's accessible to an algorithm. And then there's human judgments, which can't yet be replaced because our systems can throw through parameter space. Again, I keep saying that word, uh, but really the, the objective is to have a human validate the stage of, of this uh, in this sector, this, the state of AI is to have humans validate certain things before we put them on, on production, and make them autonomous. It's a scary proposition for everybody to have autonomous machines running basic infrastructure because we want our lights to be on. We don't want to take that risk. I will add to this that, you know, humans make mistakes and we have blackouts because of human error all the time. Uh, so the partnership is really with the people who will be using the the, the machinery that we're providing because they have all the knowledge uh, that we need to make our machinery perfect. Well, from our perspective, we need um, uh, to, to look at the drilling side of things. We would need surface drilling data for between five and 10 wells and provided we are able to deliver something that looks good and can be tested on independent test data that the this the company providing the data uh, also will allow us to to run it live, so we have a first user. That that would be what what we would need to get going. Yeah, and um, for uh, for our perspective, I mean, uh, I talk a little bit about uh, the natural language or, or spoken language as a as an interface to um, to technology, and that of course also applies for data. So. Uh, what we've been looking at is these uh, processes where these, these sort of manual processes that are very data intensive, right? 
Um, 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 and it's uh, 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 and there's a lot of, of of these professions that sort of have this right now. It, it, it's geologists, uh, geology, but but of course it's also applicable to a lot of of of, of other professions as well. So um, so applying this technology in that context can be a real uh, time saver. I mean, sometimes people spend weeks or months uh, looking for for, for stuff in, in large document collections. Uh, this is operations that uh, 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 AI can do in in, in seconds, right? Um, that that's one perspective. Uh, but also, uh, as I uh, talked about in my presentation, uh, these generative models are really good at sort of um, mimicking uh, language patterns um, in the way they generate content. So they can be used to sort of uh, summarize or create insight in a specific. Um, style, so so to say, for a specific audience, and of course also different audiences across an, uh, an enterprise. So that's also a very, um, very um, uh, well, interesting uh, uh, thoughts. But yeah, there, there, there's, there's many use cases. <laughs> so, I like that translation piece a lot, actually. I've seen this uh, used in some, some friends that I have in, in government who use generative AI to translate say, okay, you have uh, something from the Ministry of Transport and you want to translate into the language of the Treasury. And there's different language that two ministries use inside the same government, right? So that translation piece is really interesting. Exactly. So so that's, yeah, exactly. There's a lot of use cases for it. So. There's a lot of question is coming to our way. I think we are going to share that with you panelists and hopefully we can, uh, the audience can reach out to you. I think we have a, a a little bit around three minutes to close this session. So I would like to end this and give you uh, one minute uh, uh, for each to close the, uh, the session and put your statement and one question. So for our audience that eager to explore uh, the intersection of AI and geothermal further, uh, can you please recommend uh, your suggestion around the book, article, any resource that provide insight uh, to further enhance their knowledge? We can start with Ole. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of sources. So the, the, the thing with... Uh, uh, the type of stuff we're working with is almost outdated as soon as it's written down because people are constantly doing new stuff. Uh, but on the on the uh, the usage of generative models, uh, like large language models, I could recommend David Shapiro. He has some really interesting thought uh, experiments on on, on those uh, uh, type models. But, but of course, there's so much information out there um, and more and more every day. So yeah. Google it. Olaf? Not really, as, as Ola says, there's a, there's a lot of, of, um, of information out there. So um, um, what, what I do, and I believe uh, our lead data scientist does the same thing, is that we, we use Google and other, other search engines and um, you know, try to drill down in things that we find interesting. And um, um, it, it's really good to see that uh, sites like ResearchGate and, and several other publishers actually publish um, uh, articles, uh, entire journals uh, for free, which is, uh, which is a great asset for us. Nicholas? I'd say, yeah, for cutting edge intersection of geothermal and AI, I'd go to the archives of the Stanford Geothermal uh, Workshop um, and if you just do a search with AI and you'll come up with a lot of stuff in all of the areas that we've talked about today, I think. Uh, maybe I haven't seen a generative AI application at Stanford yet, uh, but yeah, for drilling and for optimization, definitely a lot of a lot of work has been presented. And in fact, the data curation and and uh, data standards piece that I was talking that I was talking about uh, before, um, that's a, that's a Stanford paper as well. And in terms of parting thoughts, I will stick with data curation. Uh, I think in the energy sector, we work absolute marvels by creating facilities that last for generations. But we have to get our head around the idea that digital infrastructure is meant to become outdated, obsolete every five years. We can't. We've, we're having trouble getting our head around that. We think in transformational 10, 20 year plans when the infrastructure only lasts two or three. 
that we need to get that extra mode of operation in our day to day of making digital infrastructure because that's really what we need to to revolutionize everything. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ole, Olaf, Hercules, for the presentation and this panel. Uh, hopefully, we see you again next year at Pivot 2024. And uh, also, thanks to the audience. So, I am going to close this session and uh, see you later. <laughs>